Good evening, everyone. This is the first virtual IBL Innovation Seminar. I hope it's the last. We do one every year. We have a really interesting subject tonight. Was Regeneron right or wrong? Which I suppose also involves what did Regeneron actually decide? I'm not going to say anything about it. Matt Fisher is going to run the show. And thank you all for coming. And I hand over to you, Matt, straight away, because time is short. Well, thank you, Robin. Um, and hello, everybody. Uh, this, as Robin has said, is going to be about the uh, the Regeneron case. And uh, we're going to move through our uh, illustrious panel of speakers uh, with uh, a variety of different views on the uh, on the material before us. We have on our panel tonight uh, Nicola Dagg, starting off, who is a partner in the IP litigation team in the London office of Kirkland Ellis uh, International. She has extensive experience in pharmaceutical and biologics patent uh, litigation in a wide variety of areas, and has served as UK and European uh, Global Coordinating Council for numerous strategic IP litigation cases over her career. And uh, she will be speaking first. She'll then hand over to uh, Dr. Penny Gilbert, who is partner at Powell and Gilbert LLP. Um, Powell and Gilbert were solicitors for uh, Kymab. In the current case, um, Kirkland and Ellis were uh, solicitors for Regeneron. So we have both sides uh, represented. Um, Dr. Gilbert has uh, represented clients at all levels in the UK and beyond and has a wealth of experience also coordinating multi-jurisdictional patent litigation. We also have, uh, giving uh, different uh, opinions on the, uh, on the case, uh, Dr. Klaus Bacher, presiding judge of the 10th Civil Senate of the German Supreme Court. Um, this is, amongst other things, the highest authority for patent and utility model uh, infringement proce uh, proceedings, as well as patent invalidity and utility model uh, cancellation proceedings in Germany. And uh, he will then be handing over to uh, Judge Kathleen O'Malley, who, is, uh, who sits on the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit in the United States. Um, and prior to this, uh, she sat as a uh, US District Court for the Northern District of Ohio, and so also has a, a wealth of experience in this area. And finally, uh, she'll then be handing over to uh, the Right Honourable uh, Lord Leonard Hoffman, who needs little introduction uh, in this field, honorary professor of intellectual property law uh, Queen Mary, at uh, Queen Mary, visiting professor at the uh, University of Oxford, uh, chair of the Institute uh, of Intellectual Property Research Council, judge of the Court of Final Appeal of Hong Kong, and of course, Lord of Appeal in Ordinary from 1995 to 2009. So I think you'll agree, a, a truly uh, stellar panel to discuss this case tonight. Um, in which case my job here is, is pretty much done for the time being. So I'll hand over to Nicola and ask her to kick off the proceedings. So Nicola. Thank you, Matt. Let me start, first of all, most importantly, by congratulating Penny and the Kaimab legal team for their victory um, in the Supreme Court. Matt asked me to talk a little bit about the invention um, and perhaps the better, best way of me introducing it would be to use the words that the Court of Appeal used when they described the invention in Regeneron's patterns. So they said it was the invention of the reverse chimeric locus was a striking, radical and highly original departure in the art. And indeed the Supreme Court said it was a groundbreaking invention. And if I might add just my own little bit of color, it is an invention that has grown brought great benefit to the scientific community and to patients. But just stepping back, the patterns concerned genetically engineered mice that are used for the production of human antibodies to fight various diseases. And the preferred approach at the priority date was to insert genes coding for a fully human antibody into a mouse whilst you inactivated the equivalent of mouse genes and that made a transgenic mouse. But that mouse produced human rather than murine antibodies. And th those fully human antibodies are illustrated in the yellow antibody, which is second to the second in on this slide. But the trouble was that the immune system of these mice was impaired 
and they were inferior at producing antibodies. Sometimes they fail to produce antibodies at all in relation to intended targets, and their immune systems were generally suppressed. Dr. Yankopoulos, who is the chief scientific officer at Regeneron, remarked and noted that the mice had what he called an immunological sickness. And he identified the cause and the cure of the immunological sickness. So he realized that there needed to be communication between the antibodies as they're being produced and the various cells and other components of the mouse's immune system. And this communication happens through the constant regions of the antibodies, that's the green bits that are illustrated in the, in the antibody that has the red circle around it in this slide. But in the prior art mice, those human constant regions couldn't engage with the mouse's immune system. The species mismatch meant that there was effectively a breakdown in communication and an impairment in the production of antibodies. So Lisa, maybe you can just take down the slides for a moment. So Dr. Yankopoulos' solution was to retain the murine constant region genes and to insert only the human variable region positioned right next to the retained endogenous mouse constant region genes. And this produces the reverse chimeric antibody, actually Lisa, if you don't mind just popping up that slide again, with the human variable region, which is shown in, sorry, the human variable region, which is in yellow, and the mouse constant region, which is in green. And when, when you've got that reverse chimeric antibody, or indeed the reverse chimeric locus, which encodes for it, the mouse does not have the immunological sickness. Now, Dr. Yankopoulos had his idea at a time when, as Mr. Justice Henry Carr found, the thinking in the art was, and I'm quoting from the judge here, unidirectional, narrowly focused, myopically obsessed, one might say, with the production of human antibodies. So Regeneron filed for patent protection for the reverse chimeric locus. And I should just say that locus is a reference to the location of a specific gene on a chromosome. And here we're talking about the immunoglobulin gene. And through, looked at through Regeneron's eyes, the technical contribution was solving the problem of the immunological sickness, or putting it another way, facilitating the, the making of immunologically efficient mice. So the reverse chimeric locus of the invention is shared with each and every transgenic mouse that comes within the scope of the claims. And I'll show you one of the claims in a moment. Each mouse has a reverse chimeric locus each mouse produces reverse chimeric antibodies and benefits from the lack of immunological sickness. Lord Justice Kitchen, as he then was in the Court of Appeal, remarked that it was an arresting and conspicuous feature of the reverse chimeric locus that a mouse with just a small reverse chimeric locus comprising only three V gene segments showed an immunological response that was close to wild type. In other words, those mice with just this small human insert had, the, had, had, had overcome the immunological sickness of the prior art mice and the problem was solved. But as, you, as everybody who will have read the Supreme Court judgment fully understands, Lord Briggs for the Supreme Court decided that it was truly a shortcoming in the invention itself, that at the priority date, its use was limited to an insertion of only a small part of the human variable region. The majority in the Supreme Court took the view that there was a shortfall in the Regeneron patents, and that shortfall lay in the inability to create a reverse chimeric locus that involved the whole or anything other than a small part of the human variable region. Lisa, if you go to the next slide, please. So I just want to show you 
um, the claimed invention. This is claim one of the 163 patent. And as you can all see, this is a product claim, a claim to a transgenic mouse with a reverse chimeric locus. So you find the reverse chimeric locus in the claim if you read the words that begin, wherein said mouse comprises an in situ replacement of mouse VDJ regions with human VDJ regions at a murine chromosomal immunoglobulin heavy chain locus. And then the claim goes on for, with the same point on the light chain locus. You can also see the reverse chimeric locus being specified functionally at the beginning of the claim, where it reads that a transgenic mouse that produces hybrid antibodies containing human variable regions and mouse constant regions. So, Lisa, you can drop the slide, thank you. Every, Regeneron's case was that everything falling within the claim has a reverse chimeric locus and therefore enjoys the benefits of the reverse chimeric locus. And in, in, that is the cure for the immunological sickness of the prior art mice. Regeneron's case was that the language in the claim is general. It doesn't call for a specific amount or range of DNA to be inserted into the mouse genome. But in contrast to how things went in the Court of Appeal, the majority in the Supreme Court focused on the quantum of replaced material at the reverse chimeric locus. So in the Court of Appeal, the focus was on the reverse chimeric locus as a principle, a, a principle of general application, whereas in the Supreme Court, the focus was very much on the quantum of material replaced at the reverse chimeric locus. And certainly in my view, I think that difference in focus is what led to the different results. In the Supreme Court, Lady Black dissenting said that the claim was enabled across its scope. In her view, this was because the principle of the reverse chimeric locus is deployed in each mouse across the range, irrespective of the quantum of human material incorporated. So, the question for the Supreme Court was whether the patents fell for insufficiency because Regeneron had not provided information to enable the skilled person to make all the mice with reverse chimeric loci that would fall within claim one. In the end, there was actually little disagreement with the Court of Appeals statement of the legal principles, but the majority in the Supreme Court diverged from the Court of Appeal on how these principles were applied. And at this point, I'll hand over to Penny on that topic. Thank you, Nicola. So um, I've been asked to explain the decision of the Supreme Court and just as Nicola's done, just to try to put into context what the uh, invention was that was the subject of the patent and what was the technical contribution. Sorry, there we go. Um, so a very pretty sharp slide just to demonstrate uh, the difference between human uh, and chimeric uh, antibodies. But essentially this was a case about um, means of making therapeutic antibodies that could be used in humans to treat diseases. Um, such antibodies can be made in mice. And in the prior art mice, um, those platforms had the problem of being, as Nicola described, and in the, in the Kind of language of this case, immunologically sick. So they contained all of the human um, antibody gene sequences, the variable and the constant regions, with the result that they were not, the B cells didn't mature properly and you had low levels of antibodies produced generally. Um, Regeneron's proposal was that um, if you retained the constant region in the mouse and instead inserted and replaced the human variable regions, uh, put those into the mouse, uh, then that would overcome the problem of immunological sickness, as Nicola described. But I want to just pause there and distinguish two, uh, two points. Firstly, immunological sickness, the sort of low production of antibodies generally, but secondly, the concept of antibody diversity. Now, if you're making uh, antibodies for the purpose of trying to find new therapeutic treatments, 
what you really want is a, a large pool of diverse antibodies in which you can fish to try to find those which are going to be potentially useful drug candidates. And what that requires is the generation of as many different antibodies uh, as the mouse can make. Uh, that's the concept of diversity. And the way that that works is at the genome level in the mouse, and um, the variable regions of which there are 200, about 125 human variable sequences, um, recombine uh, and they interact with a number of D and J sequences as well to produce a, a very large combinatorial number um, of possibilities within different B cells. And so these B cells, when they produce, when they mature, different uh, antibodies which have different binding sites and um, from which you can hope to fish out ones that will be useful for the disease that you're interested in. So antibody diversity, for the purpose of actually using this mouse platform um, for research and for making uh, therapeutic products is actually quite important. So just looking at the patents, there are actually two patents in suit here, uh, divisionals, um, 163, which Nicola showed you the claim for, and the parent patent at 287. The specifications were essentially the same. And in fact, the large body uh, of those patents related to a new generic engin engineering technique, um, which involved vectors with long homology arms to allow you to target, uh, insert in a targeted fashion, large stretches of cloned DNA uh, into the target genome. And these were termed LTVEX. Uh, and they were you know, a generally new way of introducing large sequences uh, in a targeted fashion. It was only when you get to example three of the specification um, that you reached uh, the proposal that actually these methods could be used to insert human variable sequences into the mouse, leaving the constant region present in the mouse, and that such mice might not suffer from the immunological sickness um, that the prior art mice did. And in fact, um, you'll see here at, at figure 4a, because there is no um, example that actually works uh, that proposal, but there is um, in figure 4a a suggestion that in fact, in three steps, you might be able to change the whole of the human variable sequences um, in the mouse genome, replacing uh, in a three-step uh, replacement <coughs> experiment about 1.25 megabases of DNA, which is, for those of us uh, who are molecular biologists, a quite a large amount even um, by today's standard. So I think it was generally accepted that um, by the experts on both sides of the case, that it was really um, expected um, that somebody trying to work the patent would be wanting to replace as many variable human sequences into the mice as possible to improve diversity. So uh, here were the claims. Claim one was a method claim for making these reverse chimeric mice uh, using LTVEX. Claims five and six were mice which were obtainable by the method of claim one. So in other words, that had the same features, they had the reverse chimeric locus, but weren't made using the LTVEC method made by any other method. Um, in the divisional claim one was to, again, to products to mice comprising the reverse chimeric locus, however made, there was no limitation to the way in which were produced. And claims two and three were to methods of making those antibodies um, using the mice of claim one. In fact, claim one was not infringed by Chimab um, because Chimab didn't use the LTVEC method, they used a different approach. Um, and in fact, it was 13 years later, um, after the priority date in 2001, that uh, Chimab published the way in which they made their Chimouse uh, in nature in 2014. And at first instance, uh, Mr. Justice Henry Carr um, also held that the way in which Regeneron made their full length variable sequence mouse um, also involved inventive methods and wasn't produced until quite some time after the priority date. In fact, the judge at first instance, having heard all of the evidence, um, decided that in fact, none of the, that the, the specifications didn't enable any mice with a claim within the claim range to be made, so nothing at all. Um, so following the description um, and examples in, uh, in uh, example three, uh, didn't get you there. Further proposals put forward by the experts in the case also didn't get you there. So nothing could be made. And although he said that the concept of the chimeric locus, as Nicholas um, reported, was inventive, he did go on to say that a reverse chimeric locus is not a principle which enables the method to be performed. This is looking at claim one of 287, but rather it's the result of successfully carrying out that method. So moving on to the Court of Appeal, um, 
At the Court of Appeal stage, Regeneron proposed a further approach uh, aimed at making the reverse chimeric mice um, that was reliant upon common general knowledge. And this was the minigene approach that you'll see referred to uh, in the Supreme Court judgment. It was held by the Court of Appeal that it was possible using this method to make something falling within the claims, but it was accepted um, by Regeneron, but in fact, it wasn't possible at the priority date uh, to make the full length uh, human variable sequence insertions. And this is a di diagram which shows roughly um, what could be made under the Medigine method according to the Court of Appeal judgment. You'll see that little red dot down at the bottom right hand corner of the screen. So nevertheless, uh, the Court of Appeal decided that the claims were enabled to cross their scope because the pattern protected a groundbreaking invention such that every mouse, as and when it could be made, would have the benefits of it, they'd be cured of the immunological sickness. So Kymab appealed that decision to the Supreme Court, as we all know now. Uh, they appealed on two bases. The first was the introduction of the, uh, the new, the procedural issue of the introduction of uh, a new um, method, a new argument on the way that the invention could be worked at the Court of Appeal. And the second was the issue of sufficiency, and it's the issue of su sufficiency that uh, went forward. And this is the question that was raised uh, on the appeal. Effect effectively, uh, it's an appeal on the mismatch of the claimed monopoly uh, against the disclosure of how to work the invention uh, in the specification. So uh, the question was, um, for a valid patent under Article 83 of the UPC, is it necessary for the skilled reader to be able to make products across the whole scope of the claim, or is it enough that they could make products with only, within only a limited part of the range, provided that all of the products within the scope of the claim, if and when they could be made, would use the invention? So the Supreme Court reviewed the UK case law, notably, as we're well aware of, uh, the Biogen and Mediva case, Kirin Amgen, Generics and Lundbeck, and also looked at the key cases from the EPO, notably the Exxon Fuel Oils case, T409 of 91, Unilever detergents, T435 of 91, and also what at first sight appears to be a bit of an outlier, T92, T292 of 85, Genentech polypeptide. From that, the Supreme Court uh, established a number of principles. Firstly, they said, the purpose of the requirement for sufficiency is to ensure that the extent of the monopoly conferred by the patent corresponds with the extent of the contribution which it makes to the art. And in the case of a product claim, that contribution to the art is the ability of the skilled person to make the product itself rather than the invention itself, if the invention is different. And that's what enablement means. It means actually making what's claimed. So the disclosure, coupled with the common general knowledge, must be sufficient to enable the skilled person to make substantially all of the types of products that are claimed. Where a product includes a claim which can't be made, then it will exceed the contribution to the art, subject to a de minimis position uh, or any wholly irrelevant exceptions. So this doesn't mean that the patentee has to demonstrate that each and every embodiment within the scope of the claim has been tried, tested, and proved to have been enabled. Uh, to be made. Patentees may rely, if they can, upon a principle of general application, but only if that principle of, gen principle of general application enables the products to be made. Enablement across the scope of a product claim is not established merely by showing that all products within the relevant range will, if and when they can be made, deliver the same general benefit, regardless of how valuable and groundbreaking that intervention may prove to be. Nor will a claim which in substance passes the sufficiency test be defeated by dividing the product claim into a range denominated by some wholly irrelevant factor. And in this case, the Supreme Court pointed to the totally irrelevant issue of the length of a mouse tail, mouse's tail. That obviously has nothing to do in the concept of the claims uh, to, the, uh, to, the, to, to the invention. So applying those principles, Lord Briggs held for the majority. And as we heard, uh, Lady Black dissented but Lord Briggs for the majority held that the claims were not enabled. In the case of a product claim, the contribution to the art is the product which is enabled to be made by the disclosure, not the invention itself. As he went on to say, patents are about products and processes. They're not about pure ideas. So the idea of curing the immunological sickness for which the number of human variable sequences inserted into the mouse is totally irrelevant is not an end in itself, but it's a means to the end of producing a mouse 
which produces in turn a stream of antibodies with a variety of human variable regions from which to find therapeutic antibodies for eventual use in treating human diseases. So with that, I'll pass over uh, to, to Klaus, who will give his perspective from Germany. Thank you very much, Penny. Good evening, everyone. This is one of the biggest audiences I've ever spoken to, and it is by far the biggest audience I have spoken to from my desk at home right away from my living room. So thank you very much for giving me the opportunity uh, to give some German perspectives on this very, very interesting case. Uh, the German Supreme Court has uh, made several decisions on this question, on the question uh, to what extent an invention has to be disclosed if uh, the claim contains functional or as we sometimes call them generic uh, features. And well, the basic principle which the court has established some 10 years ago might not be too big a surprise for you. Uh, the extent to which the invention has to be disclosed depends on the contribution the invention has made to the art. Uh, so the, f well, the, the, the more uh, fundamental the invention is, uh, the more the patentee may be entitled to claim uh, what we call generic features, uh, functional features, features which are only defined by their function. There are two cases uh, by which I would like to demonstrate to you how we apply this principle. The first of these cases is also mentioned in the Supreme Court decision. It's paragraph 45, and it has the beautiful name of the peptidyl peptidase inhibitors. And it's about, as the Supreme Court stated rightly, as the UK Supreme Court stated rightly, it's about uh, the use of these inhibitors for a certain enzyme, which is called the uh, peptidyl peptidase, uh, for treating diabetes. And uh, the patent said, well, we have found out if well, this enzyme is, is part of the, this inside the body. If you inhibit this enzyme, the peptidyl peptidase, the human body will start producing more insulin. So you can use this effect to treat uh, diabetes without injecting insulin, just by, well, enabling the body to produce more insulin. Uh, the claim was uh, directed at the use of each and every substance which has this effect, which inhibits this enzyme to treat diabetes. The patent was granted in this version, but there was an opposition. And on this opposition, the German uh, Patent and Trademark Office uh, partially revoked the patent and upheld it only in an amended version, which was limited to four substances, which were disclosed in the patent itself, and which, well, which inhibited this peptidyl peptidase enzyme. Because the patent office and later on also the patent court held there may be other substances who have the same effect, but nobody knows how to find them. So it would take another inventive step to find more of these substances. And therefore, uh, the invention has only been disclosed for this four concrete substances, which are mentioned in the patent and for nothing else. Uh, this decision by the patent court was appealed to uh, the Supreme Court. And we set aside this uh, decision because uh, the patentee had alleged the uh, patent court uh, hadn't uh, taken evidence on this question because they thought it's irrelevant, but the patentee had alleged that they were the first in the patent to disclose this effect. And uh, therefore they were the first to show that you can treat diabetes by inhibiting this enzyme. And we said, well, if this turns out to be true, 
then the contribution, the invention made to the art is very, very, very big. And therefore the patentee is entitled to claim the use of each and every substance who has the same effect, be it a known substance or be it a substance who has to be found and also be the substance who has who can be found only uh, by another inventive step. Uh, so this was one decision. The other decision I want to uh, demonstrate to you is a little bit older. It's about, I think, one or two years older. Uh, it's called thermoplastic composition. It's about uh, composition of several plastic materials used for uh, the front and back covers of cars. And uh, the patent was about two key features of this composition. The first one is uh, high electrical conductivity. And the second one is uh, toughness against notches and, and, and something else. Uh, in prior art, there were met many methods known for increasing the electrical conductivity. There were many methods known for increasing toughness of this material, but it was difficult to increase both of these, of these features at once because uh, doing the one thing normally meant, while increasing the one thing normally meant that you would, uh, would decrease the other, the other feature. And so the patent found a new method for having very uh, good uh, uh, very good uh, rates for both of these features. And they claimed, so let's say a conductivity of X and uh, toughness of Y, and they claimed compositions with a conductivity of at least X and a toughness of at least Y without any upper limit. And again, uh, the, the claimant said this invention is not fully disclosed because nobody knows how to raise both of these values without any limit. And in this case, we, uh, we partially revoked the patent because we said uh, the invention was not of, uh, well, of, of, uh, of showing a new class of product or anything else, but just showing a new way of well of reaching a new range of uh, these two features and therefore the patentee was only uh, uh, entitled to claim this range which he has made available to to reach for the person skilled in the art so the solution was uh, the patent was revoked in the form in which uh, it was granted uh, but instead uh, the patentee got a claim uh, which was uh, directed to a product by process. This means every composition which is obtainable uh, by the new method uh, the patent has, uh, has disclosed. So I think both approaches can be found in the Supreme Court decision. So it's just a question of whether or not a certain case is on the one hand side of this border or, or on the other side. And in my view, this always depends. So having heard those two cases, you might ask how the German Supreme Court would have decided on the Regeneron case. The only short answer I can give you is, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> there's one question I'm asking myself for quite uh, a long time since, uh, the decision has been published. The Supreme Court said there is a major difference between a use patent, as was the case in our in our depeptidyl uh, peptidase inhibitors, and a product patent, as was the case in Regeneron. Uh, I'm not pretty sure if that really makes a difference, because in depeptidyl peptidase, it's true. We didn't uh, grant a patent claiming substances which were not known and of which nobody knew how to make them, but we claimed a patent covering the use of substances nobody knew and nobody knew how to produce at the priority date. So the main question for me is, does it really make a difference whether the patent covers a product 
or the use of an unknown product? And I'm pretty unsure on how to answer this question. And I look forward to getting answers to this question from the other uh, people on, on, the, on the panel tonight. Thank you very much. And uh, I pass on to Kate. Thank you, Klaus. I said the easy answer is that we could just deal with the patent the way our court did, which was to invalidate it, uh, invalidate the U.S. patent for uh, inequitable conduct, and then, and then you're done. You don't have to struggle or uh, engage in such angst. But, um, but the reality is the question that Robin posed is: it, Did the court get it right, or did the court get it wrong? And I think it always depends on the predicate facts that are being analyzed. And if we accept the proposition that, as the Supreme Court said, that this is a patent, a product patent, not a method patent, and not even a, a product by process patent, but an actual product patent to a product that, that is made up of, of certain elements. And then we accept the fact that, that, um, that the claim is to a range of products that that covers all of the possible ranges of the human V segments. And we accept the fact that, as the court said, the parties seem to, to agree that it took several years and a lot of experimentation uh, to ultimately obtain the full range um, of, of the, the claim. If that's the case, then under our case law with respect to enablement, that would clearly fall within the bounds of what's called undue experimentation. Um, meaning it is when you, when you look at the fact that we are talking about a complex area of law, you're talking about high levels of, of expertise for one of skill in the art, and you're talking about something that, that did take substantial um, investigation and innovation in order to accomplish. I think it's likely that under our basic principles of enablement uh, that, that this patent would fail that test. Um, again, it depends on whether you accept all the factual predicates, which the court said either were uh, factually undisputed or uh, not debated at, at the level of the appeal, especially the, the claim construction. Um, so assuming all of that is the case, then I think that, that under the US version of our enablement analysis, it would fail. I also think it's likely that, again, assuming all those facts to be true, that it would also fail what, what we have as a second prong of our analysis uh, with respect to whether or not the uh, specification is sufficient for purposes of the scope of the claim that is presented. So we have both an enablement provision, enablement requirement, and a written description requirement. With enablement, you're allowed to fill in the, the gaps in what might be disclosed uh, with the, the common level of skill in the art. Here, I think the Supreme Court expressly found that there was not enough common level of skill in the art to fill in those gaps. Um, but with respect to written description, you can't fill in the gaps because the point of the written description requirement is not so much the bargain with the public in terms of what we've disclosed, but to make sure that, that the whole scope of the claim was actually within the bounds of the inventor, within the, the hands of the inventor at the time of the claim. This is sort of the way I phrase this as, you're not allowed to patent a hunch. You can't say, I think this is gonna work across a broad genus and then claim that genus without sufficient disclosure. So I think that under either enablement or written description, it's again, assuming all the predicate facts that this patent would fail in the US. Um, I don't know that for sure because we haven't applied this law to these facts, uh, but I think that it is likely. Um, in fact, we at least, some say we've gone even farther because we have um, recently in the Wyeth case and the Identix case, um, which is 
Identix is, uh, there's a petition for cert pending, so we'll see whether or not our court was correct. But we've gone so far as to, to say when the scope of the genus is so broad that it would require a, a broad scope analysis of lots of different options, uh, that even if the experimentation uh, would be basic as it relates to each of those particular options, if it would have to be conducted over billions and billions of po possible combinations, then we would still find the patent uh, to, to not be either enabled or to satisfy the written description requirement. Uh, so in the Identix case, uh, the issue was the hepatitis C and the hepatitis C vaccine. And the claim was, was very broad. It was, um, it, it was two nucleosides with a particular methyl group. So it was to nuclear, nucleosides that have a methyl group in the two prime up position and non hydrogen substituents at the two prime down and three prime down positions. Um, the, the point of this is not to have you immediately envision what that means, but it's that everybody accepted the proposition that there were billions of potential nucleosides with that type of methyl group um, and that an ordinary person of skill in the art might know that there are billions of them, but without experimenting as to each one, wouldn't know exactly which one would work with respect to hepatitis C. And our court found the, the patent to be invalid um, uh, under both enablement and written description provisions. Uh, the Supreme Court is visiting that right now. There's a lot of strong amicus support uh, because they believe we have destroyed um, the chemical arts industry, um, but, uh, but even where the actual experimentation is not as complex as the Supreme Court, uh, the UK Supreme Court to think it, think it would have been in the Regeneron case, if, if it is uh, as broad as it, at, as it was in Identix and Wyeth, it would still fail under enablement or written description. So with that, again, I don't know for sure whether, there, whether the answer is right or wrong, but as, as is always the case when you're at the Court of Appeal, you have to base it on the, on to the underlying facts. So I'm assuming those underlying facts and findings were, were the predicate upon which uh, I had to base my guess as to whether it's right or wrong. So I'm gonna turn it over, over to Lord Hoffman, who I think he'll probably tell us whether it was right or wrong. I must confess, I was startled by the result of this case. Uh, which uh, seemed to me to be obviously wrong. And uh, I think it went wrong in the very first sentence of the judgment, which I've uh, put up on the slide. Uh, it said, uh, this appeal uh, challenges uh, the uh, validity of two patents which seek to confer a monopoly over the creation of a range of types of transgenic mice. Now, the the patent here was a product patent, but it was a product defined by one feature of the way in which it was made, namely by the use of the uh, reverse chimeric locus. It uh, did not claim, uh, it did not define uh, uh, what it was claiming uh, by reference to any other feature of it. The question of, it uh, did not purport to be uh, a, a patent for uh, general ways of making the mice, uh, such as, for example, uh, methods of inserting uh, the uh, various segments into the genes. So uh, that's, the, that's the way in which the patent was defined. And if you look at the next slide, which is the, uh, you've seen already, which is the claim, you can see that that is all it is. It is uh, a claim to a, uh, a mouse defined by the fact that it has been made by the uh, uh, um, made, made by the by a method which includes the uh, 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 reversed chimeric locus. Now, if we go on for a moment to the uh, paragraph 22 of the judgment, uh, you can see where, where they're going wrong there in a moment. Can you go on, to, uh, never mind about that one. Uh, and uh, 
let's go on to the next one. Right. Uh, he says that uh, the claim is to mice which produce a stream of antibodies uh, with human variable regions. And the disclosure more generally shows this stream is for eventual use in treating disease in humans. He says, true it is that the particular groundbreaking contribution is the delivery of a means of preventing or greatly reducing murine immunological sickness. And, uh, 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 but he says, marine immunological health is not an end in itself. It is a means to a different end. Now, it's perfectly true that uh, what one uh, wants is uh, mice in which you can have, as, as, as Penny put it, a diversity of, of, of antibodies. But this particular invention doesn't claim that. And I always thought that uh, the requirement of sufficiency is that you must be able to perform the invention, not that you have to perform every possible embodiment of the invention. And uh, in that respect, it seems to me that our law was exactly the same as that described by Klaus, that if you have a, a, a product which is defined uh, by one particular aspect of the way in which it is made, then uh, provided that is inventive and so forth, uh, in, uh, the, the sufficiency of the invention shows that that particular uh, uh, method of making the product will result in what it claims it will result in. Now, uh, in, in all this invention promised was that the mouse on which reverse chimeric locus had been used would not be immunological, immunological sick, sickness. And the Supreme Court requirement took that far much further. And it seems now that uh, the specification uh, 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 and uh, it, it seems that it, it's enough, uh, that it's not enough now that the specification and common general knowledge allow you to work the inv invention uh, in the only way for which you claim a monopoly. You must also be enabled apparently to uh, 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 enable all embodiments of the invention. Well, now what's the practical result of this? If you take, take uh, Regeneron, what were they supposed to have done? Uh, what they ought to have done, apparently, is to keep very quiet about their invention until they or somebody else uh, had invented a method of uh, putting far more uh, 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 segments uh, into, the, into the gene uh, than were possible at the stage when the invention is made. Uh, what would have been the position if somebody else uh, had made such an invention and had, had patented it? Uh, would one then be able to say that their invention by the use, perhaps with a license of the other patent, would be able then to be performed across the entire uh, claim? Uh, uh, it, it, that seems to me contrary to the public interest. The, the, the decision, uh, uh, it's desirable, surely, that the reverse chimeric lotus should be made available as soon as possible, even though that means that people working on better methods of inserting the, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, segments into the gene would have to get a license in order to be able to use it. It's not infrequent that that's the way in which the patent system works, that you have one side who need a license for the invention of the other, and they in turn need, need a license for the people who've done it, who invented it, uh, another part aspect of making the product. So uh, in my view, this uh, decision has taken uh, English law down the wrong track. And uh, I think that uh, um, uh, both uh, Klaus uh, and Kate were uh, uh, very polite uh, about the way in which they said that uh, if all the uh, various uh, uh, conditions which uh, the Supreme Court had assumed were satisfied, then the, the decision would be correct. But they weren't, and it plainly wasn't correct. In which case, I think it's it's now back to me. So thank you very much to our panelists for uh, for their presentations, and we're going to start opening up to uh, to some questions. But I think it's it's probably worthwhile starting off with uh, with this idea of the patentee gaining uh, no or perhaps scant and short lived reward for what appears to be a groundbreaking invention. So what are the policy implications of this? Is this something that uh, that uh, it, 
is is to be encouraged or or is it not? Nicola, uh, perhaps you could start us off with uh, your views on this particular point. But, well, it's interesting. This this question did come up during the hearing in the Supreme Court. Um, you might say it was a kind of a rhetorical question. Um, I hope I'm remembering correctly. I think it was Lady Black who said, so what, is it just tough luck then that the patentee doesn't get uh, patent protection for this groundbreaking invention? Um, there was no real answer to that, um, albeit the question was posed. Uh, I mean, I think, I think we are in a situation where uh there was there was no other well, unless somebody can come up with a bright idea i don't think there was a way that regeneron could have got real patent protection to protect the reverse chimeric locus um by drafting any other kind of claim if they'd put limits on the size of the amount of um, human variable region that could be inserted at the time then the next day or a week later or a month later, when, as happens in the biotech industry, people come up with improvements, then their, their, patent, would have, their patent protection would have been blown. So, I, I mean, I, do, I can't remember who, which of the panelists tonight said, maybe as you might have been Lord Hoffman, it would have been better for Regeneron just to stay quiet. I think with the benefit of hindsight and the, given the way this decision has gone, it would have been better for them just to stay quiet and keep their invention on the reverse chimeric locus hidden away. Um, I mean, obviously from a policy perspective, if you can't get proper real patent protection, then it does disincentivize research. It disincentivizes you from putting it in a patent application and therefore making it available to the whole outside world. Uh, which is of course what happened here in the sense that people were able to take it forward the reverse commercial locus concept or technique and make improvements and generate therapeutic antibodies on the back of it. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think for a groundbreaking invention like this one, where you're worried about getting effective patent protection, it seems that, you know, somebody in Regeneron's shoes would be much better relying on trade secret protection as best they can. Um, in, in a scenario like this one. Okay, thank you. Penny, do you have any comments on this point? Um, sure. I mean, I, th I think it comes down to the patent bargain, um, as the Supreme Court put it, in that if you want a 20 year, 20 year monopoly, you need to disclose how to work the invention and how to make it. And if you can't do that, um, and a skilled person using their common general knowledge can't put the invention into effect um, across its scope um, to actually m make it and test it, then actually that limits the research. It means that anybody wanting to look into this um, potential use of reverse chimeric locus has got to spend an awful lot of money and time and effort um, trying to make new variants or make ways to make it work uh, to actually test it. And of course, Regeneron did file a patent later on once they had actually got the methods to work, um, which did cover um, you know, the mouse that made in, in those ways. So maybe it's just a matter of timing, perhaps with all of these things, it's a matter of timing of actually not filing too early, but actually having your invention crystallized to the point when you can actually describe it in the specification in the way that it can be used. In fact, probably pretty much along the lines of um, the US cases where you have to have a written description, um, for example. So maybe maybe that's the, the answer, but certainly, you know, we want to encourage people to file patents and put their inventions into the public domain. But it's got to be in a way that um, they can be worked. OK, thank you. Do, do any of our, our other panellists have a, a comment on this particular point? I, I think that, um, you know, I understand the, the public policy implications, but um, you know, the idea is if all you have at a particular point in time is, is a narrow group of, of claims that, that you have got control of, um, and, and with all due respect to Lord Hoffman, that the, at least the Supreme Court said that the claim seats protection for the making and exploitation of any type of mouse having specific characteristics. It, it, at least the parties seemed to agree by the time it got to the Supreme Court that it was not the method of making the mice that was at issue. And I think that is a big difference. But, but 
assuming that you will only have um, uh, control in your mind of how to make mice in a small subset of this, this genus, then what the patent law would encourage is to put it out there so that other people could build on it to then create the better, the better mousetrap, as it were. Um, having said that, I think I agree with Nicola that, that from the perspective of the, the business person that's coming up with this groundbreaking idea, uh, that, that you're probably not gonna want to be um, that kind to your competitors and that you're better off waiting, as Penny said, a matter of timing, until you have a, a broader control of what you suspect will be the full scope of the, the claim. So I think that probably waiting a little bit longer, maybe having a method claim um, would have, would have um, actually made, strengthened the patent and, um, and they would have been able to control uh, the development of, of the science. Okay, okay. Does anyone else want a, an input on this question or should we? In which case we could, we could move on. Um, where does the judgment then leave us on the issue of inventive improvements? Because if we're in a situation where we're trying to incentivize, then maybe there will be inventive improvements that occur afterwards. Uh, does this put a dampener on, uh, on, on those sort of things gaining any protection? Um, Nicola, was this one that you wanted to comment on or? I'll say something, and uh, but I'll, I'll be brief. Um, so, I mean, I think the way the way we saw it, um, as we argued, the case for Regeneron was that yes, the claim covers inventive improvements um, in in terms of the incorporation of more human variable regions, but that it shouldn't be sufficient as any such improvement still involved working the original invention, that is the the reverse chimeric locus. So looked at it that way, I mean, obviously it would be perfectly possible for third parties to make inventive improvements and to patent those. And then anybody out there who wanted to work the reverse chimeric locus invention and take the benefit of inventive improvements would have a, would need a license for the Regeneron patent um, and the improvement patents, um, a license to both patents that is. Um, but, you know, the way the Supreme Court decision has come out is very clear that, you know, you've got to be able to make everything falling within the scope of the claim. And so um, if you've got to be able to make everything falling within the scope of the claim, there's not much room for inventive improvements based on the court's decision. Um, I mean, I think what I think that, you know, it would be interesting to hear actually from the patent attorneys on this, because I think there are probably significant implications for patent attorneys and filing strategy in terms of, you know, do you consider doing an initial filing and then a follow up filing, bearing in mind that, you know, the follow up filing will always need to be novel and inventive over the initial filing. Um, I certainly, as I say, you know, I'd love to hear from the patent attorneys on this front, but it that the Supreme Court decision does seem to tilt one that way, at least from a UK perspective, uh, in terms of getting that initial filing in and then filing later for improvements. Sorry, does anyone have another view in relation to this? Penny? Uh, yeah, perhaps I could add. I mean, the, the test really is whether at the relevant date, which the parties agreed in this case is the priority date, whether the products that you would envisage falling within the claims could be made at that date. And it's not a question of making each and every product, but whether you can make a sort of sample across the range of the, of the claims, um, ignoring de minimis problems uh, and so on. And it seems to me that that actually doesn't move the law on very much at all from where we were, that we expected to have to prove enablement across the scope of the claims. Now, if someone comes along later and makes an invent invention as to how to work the pattern, for example, Chimab had a completely different way uh, of making their Chimabs um, to the methods that were described in the patent and to the methods eventually used by Regeneron. That's an inventive improvement, uh, and that was held to be an infringement of these claims if they'd been valid. So I don't really see that there's a particular problem here in terms of 
you know, claims if they're enabled at the priority date covering inventive improvements. We've had so, we've had some comments that have uh, or some questions that have come in on uh, on the chat that I'll move to in just a second. But one of the uh, the questions that uh, that came in earlier, which I'd be interested to hear the panel's view on, uh, is um, from Chris Pratt at Osborne Clark, who said that the uh, the Court of Appeal was seduced by principles of general application. They fell into error by confusing the inventive concept with the technical contribution to the art when considering sufficiency. Does the case highlight the danger in applying tests that are not statutory terms of art, but which are terms arising out of case law and then take on a life of their own? Uh, and in this context, he also refers to uh, plausibility and uh, things such as obvious to try. So I'd be interested to hear the, uh, the panel's views on those. Um, perhaps we could start off with Lord Hoffman. Uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the well, what 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 the uh, law of sufficiency requ sufficiency requires is that you should be able to work the invent work the uh, uh, claim the claimed invention across the full scope of the invention, and uh, I, I don't disagree with what Penny was saying about that. The question is, what is the scope of this invention, and the scope of this invention, as in appears from the claim, is. Uh, making uh, mice which have been made by the use of the reverse chimeric locus. That and nothing more than that. And the finding of the Court of Appeal, the finding of fact, which was not challenged in the Supreme Court, was that uh, if you made mice with a reverse chimeric locus, no matter how many of these segments you put into it or what the effect would be to improve its resistance to immunological sickness. That was the invention. There was nothing more to it than that. Uh, yes, JJ Malley. I have a question for Lord Hoffman. I mean, I can tell you that, that uh, at least a lot of lawyers in the United States would probably look at this and say, there were so many factual predicates that the court depended upon for its analysis that this doesn't really move the needle in terms of the sufficiency law very much. This is the kind of case where lawyers would say it's easy to write around it because it seems to be limited to its own facts. Do you think it has broader implications than that? No, I, that it's simply a, you mean that it's simply a question of fact on, 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 the, on the facts of this particular case? Yes, and that you can't no, take no, I, broad principles. I, I, I don't, I'm afraid. I think that this is an error of principle on the part of the, uh, on the, part of the Supreme Court. Uh, if you want to uh, find out whether uh, the uh, invention has been enabled across the full scope of the invention, You've got to decide what the invention is. What was the invention here? The invention what here was, if you used the chimeric locus, you would get an improved result on immunological sickness. That was the entire invention. And that was enabled, to, according to the Court of Appeal, across its full scope, because you were able to make some uh, uh, mice uh, by this method. And they were, you were able by making those mice to demonstrate that it would work in every case. That was the finding. Okay. Any further responses? Clives, if I could bring you in to this, what, what, what view would you have on, on either principles of general application or sticking to the statutory text, or indeed the comments that have just been made? Oh, it's, it's difficult to me, for me to make comments on the implication of a Supreme Court decision in the UK on, on UK law and, and on English law. Uh, but I think uh, uh, the, the main the main thing or the main the main reason which lies behind our decision is just what we heard in the last minutes so on the one hand of course the 
invention has to be disclosed. It may not consist of a mere idea. But on the other hand, I think if the patentee has, has opened up a, co a completely new way of, of developing or, or, or researching, uh, then <coughs> he, should be, he should be entitled to get a patent just because he enabled other people to, to move on and to, to do more research and to find better ways and perhaps better mice or anything else. So, so uh, I think uh, I have some difficulties with, with, uh, with uh, claiming that the scope of this invention covers every mouse possible on earth with uh, with this feature and therefore it has to be disclosed for every mouse or every type of mouse who who has uh, this type of of of, of loki uh, what i wonder and i'm not sure about that as i mentioned uh, the the uk supreme court mentioned our decision the pepti deal pepti daze and they said, well, uh, that, this doesn't bring us further because that decision was about a use patent. So what I'm asking myself, would it be possible based on, on the UK decision to claim the use of a mouse with these chimeric locus for, I don't know what, for the production of antibodies or 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 for, uh, for making medicaments for the treatment of this and that disease? Or is, is it likely that the Supreme Court will also say, well, the, this invention has also not been disclosed along its full range because again, uh, it claims the use of mice which haven't been invented yet. So is there a difference between, between use and, and, and mice? Or, or is there no difference? Well, does anyone else have a, a, a comment in relation to, is there a difference between use and the product claim itself? I mean, I think that I've asked myself the same question that Klaus has just asked in terms of um, whether if in fact the claim that I showed you which was the product claim had instead been a process claim to immunizing a mouse that comprises a reverse chimeric locus within it to generate hybrid antibodies, whether in that, in that scenario, we would have been able to, Regeneron would have been able to avail of the principle of general application line of case law, which the Supreme Court said that perhaps we were, well, was said that we were blocked from because it was, it was a product claim and therefore, the principle of general application um, couldn't be relied upon. So I don't know the answer to Klaus's question, but I think it's an excellent question. And maybe it would have made it easier to rely upon the principle of ge general application, that principle being the technique of using the reverse chimeric locus. But uh, can I say something about that? Of course. Yes. Uh, Matt, may I say something about that? Yes, yes, it is. Uh, I, simply to call it a product claim seems to me not good enough because the question is how the product is defined. I mean, if you take, for example, in the uh, Biogen case, what the, the product there was defined by reference to the way it was made by recombinative uh, uh, genetic techniques. Uh, and it's clearly a distinction where you simply define the product uh, by reference to its chemical composition or something like that, like in the, in, in the Lundbeck case. That is simply a, a new product. But if you define the product by reference to the way it was made, then that, that is what counts. It's the way in which it was made. And in this case, the definition was that it should be made by the use of the reverse, reverse chimeric locus. That was all. Penny, did you have something that you wanted to add here? Um, I was just going to comment on the um, dipeptidyl peptidase case, which, as you as guys mentioned, was it a use case. But there, um, you know, the claim was to the use of DPP4 inhibitors in the treatment of diabetes. And so there was no question that that could happen. You know, you could use the treatment. I mean, based on the uh, disclosure in the patent that 
um, you could use DPP4 inhibitors to treat diabetes. Um, and there was no sort of factual concern that um, DPP4 inhibitors couldn't be found or used or made at the time. So it was a slightly different situation, I think, to the situation in the Regeneron case, where there was um, concerns about making the um, chimeric locus. Uh, and I think that, that comes back to the issue again. It's sort of, although the claim was to a mouse with a chimeric locus, you still have to get to it. Um, and claim one itself was described as, it was also found to be invalid. That was a method claim because again, that could not be worked. Um, so I think that was all, all we need to say at this point. Kate, yeah. you <laughs> un unmuted. Oh, I, I was just gonna say that I do think, I think that Nicola is right. I think the analysis shifts dramatically if you're talking about a product by process claim where it, you, are, you are claiming a process, I mean, a product that is made by a particular process, or if it's a method claim, I mean, here the court specifically said it was a claim to a product with a particular genetic makeup. And so I think that the, that the, that the hiccup is, as, as Lord Hoffman points out, possibly in that, that uh, either the Supreme Court or somewhere along the line, um, the other courts or the parties uh, locked into this characterization of, of what was being claimed as a mouse with a particular genetic makeup and not as a mouse made by a particular process. Absolutely. Robin, I've just noticed you've come back, in which case, was there a point that you wanted to, uh, wanted to make? Well, yeah, there was a bit. I mean, uh, I agree with Lord Hoffman. I, I think this case is wrongly decided. Um, and uh, they didn't get the point. It's a strange, it's not always easy to get the idea that a patent may be really innovative, but not very enabling in itself at the time. It's a, it, it represents a whole new way of doing things. And that's what they've missed. Uh, if a patent had not only got to come up with a, new, a whole new way of doing things, but also spell out the whole new way of doing things as well, then you're asking too much of the patent system. I think one of the things that, 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 that uh, was behind the Supreme Court is somehow that a patent of this nature, of a general nature like this, would inhibit others later on from doing the improvements. And th that is a misconception of the patent system. Whenever you have a major invention, history shows, and it's best to learn from history, you have a massive improvements later. This is the way to go, says this patent. And of course, lots of people will go that way. And we want to encourage patents, which put up valuable signposts and which way to go. I, 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 and I, I, I think it's possible I don't know, for a future Supreme Court and possibly even a, a very bold first instance judge to say, well, this all turned on the way they understood this claim. It, it, it's a bit of judicial slight bending of the truth, but that's not been unknown in the law before. So otherwise, we've got a real problem. We've got to get up to the Supreme Court again. Well, we have we have a couple of questions that have come up on the uh, on the Q and A board here about um, uh, Markrish claims, um, which I think it's it's probably worthwhile uh, addressing here. And the first one here says that uh, one of the problems identified by uh, Mr. Justice Carr was that the method of making the antibodies was described in example three, which did not work. Therefore, the patentees were claiming all of these antibodies without disclosing how to make any of them, uh, nor could the common general knowledge remedy this deficiency. It's difficult to see why the Supreme Court decision was therefore an error. Uh, it seems that the generic Mark Rush claims in the empirical arts are often unduly broad, and comments would be, uh, would be appreciated on this matter. So what, what does the panel think about uh, the idea of Mark Rush claims and in general being rather broad? Does anyone want to start on this penny? 
Yes, I mean, Markovich claims, well, obviously it depends on the particular claim, but quite often you do see very, very broad Markovich claims around a, a sort of central core component. Um, and actually what we see now, now quite often pleaded against such claims is plausibility, whether it's actually plausible that they can be made, as well as classic insufficiency of not being able to make um, various iterations of the Markovich, uh, the, the molecule claimed by the Markovich claim. Um, but was it was it plausible that actually the skilled person could make such um, you know, claims across their scope or molecules across the scope? So, so I think their issue is an issue with Markovich claims generally, and I think it goes broader than just um, mere sort of classical insufficiency, if you like. Can I come back on that? You can. I've just written an article which is about to be published in, in Biotech Law Review. My very first big pattern case was a case called Olin Matheson. And the patent had a Marcus claim, very big claim. And there was absolutely no evidence to support it apart from an assertion that, it, that the products were better than something called chlorpromazine. This was trifluoperazine. And the judge, Pat Graham said, well, in reality, it is better. And I think that matters. In other words, he took into account post patent filing evidence. And he said, these guys have really made a big contribution. They deserve a patent. And, and the world of Marcus claims now seems to be one where you've got to have it in the patent itself. It's got to be plausible, which is almost getting close to saying obvious. So you can't have it unless it's obvious, in which case you can't have it. Um, and a lot of good inventions are being knocked out in the EPO because they say you haven't got enough in the patent. And I'm, I, I think this is a very disturbing tendency. I don't think it's got much to do with the enablement question. It's not really enablement, except when they say, well, plausibility is a branch of enablement. Uh, and that's a muddled concept in itself because plausibility is sometimes a branch of enablement and sometimes it's a branch of obviousness, and it's not actually mentioned in the, any statute anywhere, and nobody ever referred to it ever until the last 10 years. So I think there, 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 there are worrying tendencies of, of a sort of, oh, patent law is, is getting too protective and so on. It's not. It's doing a good job. Leave it alone. If I might just comment, I, mean, I agree with what both Penny and Robin have just said about Marcuse claims, but to, to go back to this Regeneron case, and I don't know if the question was presented on this case or not, but I don't think it can be said that the claims here were a Marcuse of mice. Um, I mean, it, this comes back to the debate we've been having this evening, but um, you know, all of these mice, there, there were findings of fact that all of these mice across the claim had the reverse chimeric locus and indeed that it was foreseeable that all of the mice across the claim would benefit from the reverse chimeric locus. So I think, tell me if others disagree, but I think it's quite far away from being a Marcouche of mice type claim. Changing tack slightly then. Um, we've got a question that was, uh, that was sent in from Mark Pierce at Milton Reeve. Um, which says that sufficiency is a question which has been most thoroughly analysed in life science cases. How do the panel see the Regeneron decision impacting patents in other complex technologies, such as, for example, artificial intelligence? Do they foresee uh, difficulties in protecting fundamental breakthroughs where the full extent of how those might be used cannot uh, yet have been explored? So is this something which is putting a dampener as uh, Robin has already suggested on the uh, on the patent system. Yes. <laughs> a nice, simple, simple and forthright answer. Uh, I just have a, whoops, I'm sorry. I just have a very simple point and that is that, that it, at least in the US, the less predictable the art, uh, the more likely you will have problems with enablement. Um, so I would think that in AI, it's going to be a big issue. Mm -hmm. I think I'd just add that everything's going to turn on its facts. Um, it's just based on the specification, <laughs> what the common general knowledge was at the priority date and so on. So I think it's really difficult to say, but I still stand by my position. I don't think that this case has moved 
the law very far at all. Okay. And so d does anyone think that there would be, and this is a question coming from the audience, merit in creating a special carve out for truly groundbreaking inventions or ideas to allow them to be patented and shared even where necess uh, not necessarily enabled uh, in the usual sense. So should we have something which uh, tries to promote uh, really uh, innovative breakthroughs, pioneering patents, uh, so to speak? Should they get a special category of protection? Lenny? I don't think we need any special categories and defining the categories would only cause confusion. I think the law is perfectly okay as it is. Does anyone else think otherwise or are we, we, we all content on this? Well, I am. <laughs> a nice simple one to get out of the way then. Um, what about the question of, um, and we've had actually the broader impact of this decision within and outside of the, uh, the technological area. Um, is it necessarily a problem? Is it necessarily a problem for patent policy if a promise is not fulfilled at the filing date, provided subsequent developments allow realization of that promise in its entirety at some point before the patent expires? What do our panelists think in relation to this? The idea of moving the goalposts effectively. No, That's, I think that would be very dangerous. If you want the monopoly in something, you've got to show that your, your invention can be worked at the, at the priority date. Well, uh, I'm not sure quite what you mean, Lenny. Um, you've got to say what it's for and what it does. Have you got to prove it too? No, well... <laughs> you didn't have to say, this is what my invention is, this is what it does. It's obviously, it, it's, it's not incredible, it's not, it's, not, it's not implausible. Isn't that enough? May, may, maybe, if it's not implausible, yes. But the point is, I think, that you, you, whatever the, the, the uh, criteria are, they have to be satisfied at the priority date. If you took if you took that approach, it would certainly wipe out a lot of debates over the evergreening practice. <laughs> yeah. But doesn't it go back again to the patent policy issue that uh, if you want a monopoly of twenty years, you've got to allow other people to be able to work it and develop exactly. it? Exactly. Mm -hmm. That that's absolutely right. You've got to allow people to be able to work it. What this case is about is what counts as working it. Or what counts as it? <laughs> <laughs> or work. <laughs> we, we have one more question that is, that is on the, uh, the questions and answers that I, I believe our panellists can see, um, which is uh, about uh, Markish claims, enabling the synthesis of uh, compounds across the full scope of the claim. And on that basis, the decision appears correct. Uh, however, if we take Citalopram as an example, um, the decision was that the enantiomers could not be separated without inventive effort. Da, 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 da. Would the question of infringement be uh, irrelevant? Because the patent is would be ah okay. So if we're talking about the uh, decision in terms of citalopram and uh, e-citalopram, would the question of infringement in the UK today be irrelevant because the patent covering the uh, race mate would be invalid for insufficiency? What do what do our panel members think in relation to this? Do we have any comments to make? Well, you've got two of us here from the case. Well, that I, uh, and, 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 and two of you who have already debated this case, I believe, <laughs> we, at some point. We decided it only covered the pure stuff, and if it was a racemate, it, it, wasn't, it, was, it, wasn't, it didn't fall within the claims. It wouldn't be infringed. Um, uh, 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 it had to be pure. We, we, we dodged the question of what amounted to pure, but that's neither here nor there. <laughs> racemate isn't. Um, uh, and that's that. I, I don't know that it's got much to do with uh sufficiency oh, don't remember we looked at sufficiency 
Well, in which case, I think we are almost done in relation to our questions. The, the, the only thing that re remains for me is to say thank you very much to our panel members for an enlightening and uh, entertaining discussion this evening, uh, and indeed for your presentations. And to say that the there is a, now what is it, a wonder meeting afterwards? Robin, you normally do these things, so you know what, uh, what to talk about. Well, I don't know if anybody wants to go to a wonder meeting. I don't know, I, have I got a button for that? I didn't know there has. I don't know how many people have been to, of the audience have been to a wonder meeting. It's like a cocktail party without the cocktails. You can walk around <laughs> the room and you have to move your, your, yourself. You'll see yourself there with your initials. You don't, move, you don't click on yourself and move yourself to where you want to go. You click on where you want to go. And then you move over to your, 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 your cursor. Um, well, I, hope you'll, I hope you'll forgive me, but it's half past three in the morning here in Hong Kong and I'm going to go to bed. Oh, unintelligible. I'm, I'm, what's the matter with you? Are you getting old, Lenny? <laughs> <laughs> I, I do want to tell everybody that Lenny, in fact, did. you can see Hong Kong in the background over there. And Lenny has very kindly got up for this thing and he's going to go back to bed and he can't go to sleep again until he's in court tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, th thank you, everybody, and uh, I, th I think that's that's about it from us.